Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Well, hello. Welcome back. I'm so glad you made it. You're going to really enjoy today's conversation because we've got past guest, uh, Tony Copeland Parker. I hope I got those last names in order. <laughs> yes, you did. Oh, good. So he's going to update us on what has been going on with he and Kat. You may remember if you've listened to his original episode that they were doing marathons across the world despite Kat's early Alzheimer's. So thanks for joining me, Tony. No, you're quite welcome. It's a pleasure. I Glad that you were able to fit me into your busy schedule. Oh, we we like we like to talk to people, so we make that always work. So let's back up just a little bit for anybody that might be new here that hasn't heard the original um, episode. I almost said recipe. I must be getting hungry. <laughs> <laughs> That's, pretty good. That's a definite Freudian slip. Yeah. Um, I will link the original episode in the show notes so you can go back and listen to that one, but you don't need to listen to that one to start here if that's where you're at. But let's update people who you are, what you were doing, why the hell you run marathons all over the world? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's one of the things I, uh, Catherine and I uh, met that way. Uh, she was running marathons, and I asked her to train me to run my first marathon back in 2000. The New York City Marathon. So, yeah, it's, we've been at this for quite a while. Unfortunately, 2014 rolled around. We were running races just like always. Uh, no big deal there. However, I noticed a little bit of a problem with Catherine. Uh, and I'm remembering things, asking the same questions over and over. And then she started having problems with her job. So we went to a neurologist and we were able to get a diagnosis in 2014 of early onset Alzheimer's or like condition. Because as you know, you're not really sure exactly what it is until the autopsy is done. Along the same line, I was having some problems with a uh, leaky aortic valve. So I ended up having open heart surgery around the same time. So we had those two things come at us at the same time. Our decision was to retire sell our home and uh, do what we love to do is first of all be together and second of all is run races all over the world so we set out to to do as many races and see as many countries and have as many joyful moments that we could share from time to time i was blogging and still am and uh put the blog together and uh, wrote a book like you mentioned running all over the world our race against early onset alzheimer's and that was published about two years ago. I did an abridged version of the book, and it's coming out here in May. We'll talk about it, that a little bit later. But things were going along pretty well uh, as the disease progresses, as you know. Uh, some of the capabilities uh, dwindle away. And unfortunately, uh, about a year ago, April, her ability to run was taken from her. So uh, we weren't able to run anymore. However, she still walks probably about six to eight miles a day. And uh, I needed to find some place for us to settle down. So about uh, seven months ago, I set out to, to look. It took us about three months for us to go through the whole process, which it is. It is a process because with someone that has memory issues, the first thing they want to do is, okay, we have this nice building over here. We call it memory care. And then you come visit your loved one from time to time. However, I had promised her that we were gonna do this as a team effort. So I wanted to find a facility that would take us as a couple. And I found one up here in Roswell, Georgia called Brookdale. And we're living in the independent um, setting. Uh, I do pretty much all for her. However, I do have two great ladies that come in the mornings, three to four days a week, three to four hours a day. And their basic instructions are to walk, walk, and walk. And they put in about two miles an hour. And so you're talking about, you know, like I said, she's getting about six to eight miles of walking in. And that's really good for her. She, she's tired, worn out when the day comes for bedtime. It's a good uh, seven to eight hours of sleep. And then we start out again. We do still travel. Uh, we, she's able to get on and off airplanes pretty good. 
However, I limit the flights to about two hours, and then we do a lot of uh, short car rides, um, you know, three, four hours away. So actually, we're going to leave here tomorrow and go do a small 5K race uh, in a nearby city. So that's where we are. I caught you all up on what we've been doing, and uh, ask away. I'll fill in the, the blanks. Well, let's go back to, so 2014, she was asking questions repeatedly, which is obviously a huge sign that most of us have gone through. But you also said she started having issues with her jog. What did that look like? Because not, you know, as you know, not everybody presents with a cognitive disease in the same way. And I don't think I've ever talked to anybody who presented with a physical um change that was obvious okay did i say you you probably might have heard jog but i meant job oh J-O-B. job okay job. that makes more sense <laughs> that makes more sense yeah yeah okay now, her, her physical attributes uh since running was her resilience or reserve she you know she kept that for uh, quite a bit but from the job aspect I was having a hard time convincing her that she had a problem. She was, you know, as you know, they go, oh, no, 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 that's not a problem, not a problem. I'm just didn't hear what you said or I wasn't paying attention or something like that. But when it started affecting her job, she had a new boss. And what he wanted to do was to change the whole procedure that she was using. So she had her routine. She had her sticky notes. She was able to kind of hide away you know, the the fact that she had a problem. But when he came in and he wanted things done the way he wanted them done, then she was having a really hard time. And so we got all the documentation in terms of the neurologist. And then luckily for her, she had a government job. So she was uh, given a severance and also put on disability. And then we went to Social Security and uh, applied there. And she also got Social Security disability. So that's been very helpful for those two. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, income streams to come in during our during our time and also health care she got really good health care coverage through the government which is beneficial but unfortunately there's not a lot our health care system can do for somebody with a broken brain no no we have a, a pretty good uh, neurologist team integrated mind center here in atlanta we go see them every four months uh, she loves the lady that we go see and she Tells us, you know, where we are. I fill out a questionnaire. Can she do this? Can she do that? And I get a, a pretty good indication of where she's going and also where she's been. So, uh, but, you know, we, we struggle along as a team and we do the best that we can. So these caregivers that come in daily, almost daily and walk with her, that that's a, that's a good beneficial job because you get a workout routine and a job all at the same time. You f- do you find it hard to keep them? Because that's a pretty, two miles an hour is a pretty quick pace. Yeah. I don't think I want to walk that fast. <laughs> the, uh, what ended up happening is I ended up interviewing about 30 folks for, this, for the position because I had two stumbling blocks. One was they wanted full time. They wanted eight hours a day, you know, five to seven days a week. You have agencies where you can get piecemeal but then they'll send whoever is up on the schedule and you don't know who you're getting and you know how they'll fit. And then the other thing is, you know, a lot of folks you know, from this standpoint, they rather just sit and watch somebody play cards or do a card game or watch TV or listen to the radio. And they're not really expecting to get up and, and go for a, 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 almost a jog pace. But, uh, the great thing about the, the place that we selected was that it has almost two miles of corridors indoors. So you can, you know, you're, you're covering the whole building, it's, it's tri-level, and also it has two different wings. So it is connected by the lobby area. And then it has couches, and so you can walk a half a mile, take a break. There's beautiful uh, artwork on the walls and plants and all. And then it has a half mile sidewalk back off of the major road uh, around the greatly uh, landscaped area as you know nice trees and plants and flowers a pool area and garden area so from that aspect aspect you know if it's uh, 50 degrees or warmer she's outdoors and if it's uh, raining she's indoors uh, doing the halls 
I'm looking forward to getting back to my half and half indoor outdoor workout. So, you know, as everybody knows, California has been drowning a little bit in rain this year. And it's my, uh, my workout zone is in our garage. And I actually had to move my Peloton back in the house because at 47 degrees, working out in the cold garage caused breathing issues that I didn't oh need. My, so, yeah. oh I was my. like, I thought I had bronchitis right before Christmas or right. Yeah. Right before Christmas. Turns out even with a space heater, 47 degrees is too cold. <laughs> yeah. So every is. morning I'm anxiously watching the temperature in the garage. So, cause the, I have a lot of nice stuff out there. I don't, I don't, I don't want to be stuck in the house. It's too warm in the house, too cold in the garage. I got a right. Goldilocks situation. <laughs> right. On. There you go. <laughs> But yep. I could open the garage door and look at the beautiful trees and, right. you know, it's, yep. uh, we had to take down a pine tree. So it's a little, a little bit more sunny than it was when we set it up. But, you know, I've just read that working out outdoors is actually better for you. Um, drawing a blank as to why mostly cause it's like, yeah, I totally agree with that. As long as it's not raining or cold. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so does she initiate walks or do you have to kind of, Reminder that it's time for a walk. I'm kind of She's, curious. As <laughs> unfortunately, we could say it's close to pacing. You know, as they get older in, in the degrees, the uh, disease progression, they have a tendency to pace. So she's uh, not, she doesn't sit for very long anyhow. So we, we go ahead and incorporate you know, meaningful walks as opposed to just going from the bedroom to the kitchen to the, the bathroom and back and forth. So uh, she is getting out there and uh, she she still talks, but unfortunately it's more of a gibberish uh, type of uh, aphasia. And the, all the caregivers and I, we try to catch a word and try to get her, you know, to get in a conversation you know, picking on the word that she's repeating or st stating and try to get her to, and then every now and then, you know, she just comes out with a full sentence, you know, you look really cute. I really like the way your hair is done or, you know, whatever. And then in the walks in the hallway, there's always somebody coming and going from their apartment to the dining room or the activities area. So she'll stop and she'll, she'll talk to them, you know, in her way. Uh, I had one lady, I'll never forget, she's an elderly lady. We were sitting and we were having a meal and uh, Catherine, you know, started her, wanted to chime in and wanted to contribute to the conversation. But of course, you know, nobody could understand what she was saying. And I mentioned to the lady that, you know, only she knows exactly what she's saying. She grabbed Catherine's, Catherine's hand, looked at me and says, I hear her in my heart. Aww. So it was just so sweet that she would, you know, she was able to you know, communicate that to us. Well, that kind of leads me into my next question. So obviously you found a very, a, the, the right community. It's embracing both of you. We need more of that everywhere. People that understand what dementia causing diseases are, what, how, you know, they need, they, we just need a better education public education going on so that people aren't afraid or, you know, they understand that Catherine's talking to you. Yes, you can't understand her, but you can still engage. You just got to, you know, you have to have somebody like you or me to kind of maybe explain how to engage so that, you know, you can have more interactions like you had with this gal. So what was the process of finding a place like, because you said that took about three months, which isn't horrible, but I'm sure that got tiring real quick. Yes, and of course, like I, I said earlier, they have a tendency to want to pigeonhole you into the memory care situation. Uh, there are a number of folks that are living here, and then their loved one is in the memory care, so they go over and they visit them from time to time. I explained to them that you know that's not going to work for us. Um, you know, the, I had to explain to the management folks that, you know, we were going to be together, that I do pretty much everything for her, but it was an education on their process because they, that's what they were used to, you know, folks coming in and they, oh, my wife's got dementia. Okay. She goes here, you can stay here and, and all, but, uh, I did have to uh, go through a, a bit of uh, education 
with the folks here to understand that uh, this is what we wanted and this is what we needed. And I did see at first that there was a little bit of apprehension on some of the other folks that are living here. I guess they're a little bit more accustomed to being amongst folks that have physical disabilities as opposed to mental disabilities. So, you know, over time, they, they started to, to understand. But at the same time, what I did was there was a number of folks that befriended us when we first arrived, and I gave them a copy of my book. <laughs> and then they sat down and read it, and were like, "Oh my goodness, look what you know! Look what these folks have done, you know, over the years." And then they were sharing it with their friends, and also we became kind of uh, celebrities here. So when they see Catherine in the hallway, they they always uh, stop to and acknowledge her accomplishments over over the time. So. It's been working out really good. But I think that is something, like you said, educationally, we need to start moving towards because on the early onset, she was only 53 years old. So she's going to be 62 or nine years into this. And there is a need for uh, folks like us. You know, we're still you know, relatively young, but, you know, don't want to be putting our loved ones in a facility that uh, like a memory care. They also have assisted living. Uh, we, w- we went that route. We, ch- we tried that for a little bit at another facility. However, you know, that's an overkill. You know, you got 24 by 7 care, you know, they're coming in, you know, checking on you all the time and, and all. And then, of course, the expense of all that is just, you know, why pay for something that you really don't need? Come to find out, we were thinking about going to Virginia. I have a son that's in Harrisonburg, Virginia, but they have an actual state law that as opposed to a la carte where you pay for whatever you need, you know, if you need meal prep or you need medications or changing or showering or anything like that, you pay extra. But in uh, the state of Virginia, it's all you have to pay for whether you use it or not. So, you know, you're looking at, you know, seven, eight thousand dollars right off the top a month for uh, assisted living. They probably thought they were preventing you from getting nickeled and dimed, but <laughs> but like you don't need that kind of right. assistance. Right. So you right. wouldn't be getting nickeled and dimed. You would be getting gouged. You know, yeah, there's that's the right word. So you're yeah. in an independent right. living community. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And what do they offer? Because I'm I'm only so 56, what we, what, so I'm not sure. I, I haven't checked into those too much yet. <laughs> yeah, what we get is uh, we have a very nice apartment. Uh, we have uh, two meals a day. Uh, someone comes in once a week and cleans. Uh, they 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 uh, wash your towels and sheets and change your bed. And then there's laundry facility here, garbage chute, and, you know, recycling bins. And then they have all all the activities and transportation to churches and shopping and, and all that you can need. Uh, luckily for us, the, the where we are, like I said, we're back off the major road, but you know, you go out of the facility across the street and then there's uh, plenty of grocery stores and, and uh, restaurants. And then there's a neighbor, neighborhood that backs up to us uh, that's uh it's not a through neighborhood, you know, everybody going in there is going to their home. So it's a nice place for us to, to go and do some extra walking or running when I go for a run. Speaking of running, I still do run. And what I did do is I have what is known as the Catmobile. It's a adult sized stroller. So if we go for a walk and then she gets tired, I'll put her in the Catmobile and then I'll do a little jogging and she'll want to get out and get out. Uh, we'll continue on. So if we're going to, you know, do some uh, six or eight miles, you know, at a time, you know, she can take a break in between, get some mileage in, but doesn't have the endurance to get it all in at the same time. And is that a commonly available item? Because I don't think I've seen too many of those. My mother yes. would have told me to drop dead if I had suggested one of those for her. <laughs> yeah, actually, I got it on Amazon. You could, you could okay. buy it. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, look for adult size strollers, and there they are. You know, they have well, I'm sure they're needed. Old, my my you know. mom was fully ambulatory until she fell and broke her leg back in March of 2020 when the whole world was coming unglued. So I never had to worry about those kind of things, but she was, she, and I've learned from a past, a recent past guest that the reason she did this was 
um, she would walk behind me. And, no, no, right. and there was nothing, nothing I could do to get her to walk next to me, to walk arm, you know, elbow and elbow. I mean, nothing. If I tried to get her to do that stuff, it caused a fight. And it was so frustrating because she would walk far enough behind me, like 10 or 15 feet. If I slowed down, she'd slow down. If I stopped, she'd stop. It was like, you know, I, I just knew one of these days she was going to face plant on the sidewalk and I was going to be the SOB that wasn't, you know, being kind to this, you know, my mother, this woman that needed help. And it was just going to be all kinds of ugly. And it just, it was so frustrating. And I had a recent past guest who said, and I don't know if we actually said this on the air or not. We might have, because we've done two episodes, but she was, because my mom was the oldest of four, this past guest, um, Tammy, suggested that my mom was trying to keep an eye on the children. And I'm like, man, I wish I'd known that back then because I could have play acted a little bit more. I don't think I could have gotten her close to me. The only time I got her to walk elbow and elbow, we did pretty good. Every time we'd hit a shady part of the building, she would moan and groan that it was cold, which, you know, it was cooler in the shade. <laughs> um, but then after, I think we were about three quarters of the way around the building and she just was fighting and you know, let go of me. And it's like, oh my God, it was so frustrating. So I didn't ever have to deal with canes or walkers or strollers or wheelchairs or any of that stuff. I was actually okay with her being wheelchair bound after she broke her leg, but the break was the last straw for her body. So I, I never had to try to transfer her in and out of the wheelchair or the car or any of that stuff. But we could have gotten from point A to point B in a much more relaxed fashion that would have been would have been perfectly fine with me <laughs> so you said you guys are still traveling um but you only fly about two hours so from georgia yeah she has uh about that capacity before she wants to get up and, and go do something so uh that's the, the the whole thing we we get there two and a half hours we walk the terminal we keep walking 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 to get on the airplane you know, she settles in, I have a bunch of snacks and, you know, keep her occupied, play some music or things like that. But about an hour, hour and a half, she's ready to, okay, I'm ready to get out of here. So, uh, and then if we take car rides, you know, about every hour I stop and we go for a walk, get back in the car. You, know, that you said you guys, oops, sorry, you guys are going someplace, you're leaving tomorrow after this recording? Yes. Where are you we, guys headed? Yeah, we're going to Gainesville. Uh, close by, we're going to, uh, we found actually an agency that uh, works with individuals like myself or uh, folks that have adults that uh, cannot walk anymore, but they want to, you know, they want to take parts in races. So uh, that type of thing. And uh, we're going to start out doing that. Uh, we're gonna, do a race where I'll push cat, you know, adults, uh, the cat mobile. Now, the question is whether she's, it's only a 5K, which will take me you know, about 45 minutes or so, but whether she'll sit through that whole ordeal or not is, is something to be seen. Usually, I've done some races in the past, and usually somewhere online, she wants to get out and, and walk. So we get out, we walk some, and then we get back in and, and continue. So we'll see how that works out. But yeah, there's a whole group um, that uh, they put on races and cater to folks that uh, have adults that you know, or children that can't uh, run but want to be involved in that whole experience. And their parents uh, are runners. So yep. it sounds like there's because I've never heard of such a thing. But I'm into cycling, so <laughs> um, I don't know how that would work with somebody with a cognitive impairment. If they were a cyclist before, it would probably be okay. I did participate for many years in an event. Um, it was a dual fundraising event, one for um, the Rotarians. Where we were, it was the Rotary Ride for Veterans, and obviously we were raising money for veterans. There was a specific um, program that was being run through the Veterans Association in Napa, and we were raising money for them. They were inpatient treatment, PTSD treatment 
um, home and they had a huge success rate with getting our, our service people, you know, back to, back to a place where they could exist in our society, whether or not that's exactly what they needed. I don't know. Um, but the other half was, um, people writing to raise funds for a blind camp for kids. And there was lots of people on tandems. And of course, with bike helmets and sunglasses on, you had zero clue unless somebody told you that most of the time, the person on the back half of the tandem couldn't see. Nah, I think, yeah. well, first off, I think that sounds scary, but I guess yeah. if you've been blind for a long time, it wouldn't be so bad, but right. I can't imagine riding a bike that, and you can't see where you're going. But yeah, it's kind of, you know, it's interesting how we're finally starting to get these niche kind of communities. Right. You know, obviously there's a big enough um, need for this um, group that allows you you to do your running and bring Cat with you. Um, I'm assuming. How do we know? Do you know how big that is, or are you just gonna be discovering it in the next week or so? Yeah, this is my first experience, but uh, we'll see, we'll see how this all works out. So the book running all over the world talks about your travels and your adventures and all your running. How many? states and continents and countries did you guys actually manage to get to before Pat couldn't do this anymore? Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. So we've we visited 82 countries. Uh, Catherine has run a marathon in all 50 states. Uh, she accomplished that in October of 2020. And uh, she got her 50 state in uh, Rhode Island. Got a nice little plaque along with that. Uh, that was one of the things that she always wanted to do. She was actually talking about that when I first met her, I think, 20, uh, 2000. So uh, we started doing a lot of international, so that kind of slowed her down in terms of getting the states done. But when COVID hit, uh, we started back to concentrating on getting the states done. Uh, we've done a half, at least a half marathon in 35 different countries. Uh, we've done a half marathon, at least a half marathon in all seven continents. Uh, so, wow. And uh, she's done a total of 89 marathons in her lifetime. And uh, uh, she's still very, very determined to enjoy life as much as she can. Uh, so that's Do you think that, that doing, being so physically active before her diagnosis and so adventure i don't want to, adventure prone doesn't quite sound right but that's the only words that are coming to my brain at the moment do you think that helped her move into this phase of life in a more positive active manner well i think the fact that i understood that that you know running was her reserve it was still like you know somebody who plays music and always play music so you want to try to have that available to them so I wanted to find some place that, you know, had that ability since she can't run to at least walk, you know, quite a bit. And then also be able to travel because, you know, she does know that we're getting ready to go. The suitcase comes out. She has an understanding that we're getting ready to go someplace, you know, new. 
and we're going to see you know some folks and, and meet and greet. Uh, she loves to to be around folks. She always gravitates to to groups, little kids, uh, dogs, cats, <laughs> you know, anything like that. So you know that is always a plus. And uh, I I'm not too sure whether she understands the fact that she can't run anymore and that she misses it. Uh, that part I don't I don't I don't get. Uh, I don't understand whether she has any of that awareness. And then you go to races, she sees other people running. Um, so I, I don't know whether it's that uh, still she has that cognition to that point or not. Now that would be kind of interesting to know. Right. And the traveling, I'm assuming because you guys have traveled so much that it doesn't cause anxiety. Like, you know, you wake up and you have like no clue where you are. And I know with people with a cognitive impairment, you know, taking them out of their normal routine is just generally a, a recipe for negative, a, a negative outcome. You know, I think it was in 2013, my dad took my mom to um, one of my cousin's weddings and it did not go well. Now, my dad was not super patient, so that was probably part of the problem. But my mom was confused and just anxious and just all the negative feelings and it just you know it it did not uh give my dad any confidence to continue um right you know I, trying I, those kind of things even with family yeah as it as it was explained to me travel is her routine so you know we're we're doing what we have been routinely doing it's not like i introduced it you know to her after the disease, it was something we had been doing for many years before. So she was you know, used to it. And, you know, we all have waking up where's the bathroom <laughs> syndrome, even in your own house. So for her, you know, I, you know, I would be the guy, you know, to lead her to it. And, you know, now it's, you know, something that I have to I have to take an active role in, you know, for her to be going to the bathroom. So it's not that big a deal. Not for her at all. I remember in 2018, we were flying to Toronto. We got stuck in Denver for six hours. So we got to Toronto at three o'clock in the morning. Now, anybody that knows me really well knows I am a daylight only person. I am a Californian. That means I am solar charged, no sunshine, no energy. And I remember waking up in the Airbnb and it was like, where the hell am I? What time is it? Where? It was like, about two minutes, maybe a little less, of just absolute total confusion. <laughs> and I cannot, you know, fortunately, you know, after the fog cleared from my brain, it was like, oh, yeah, we're in Toronto. And I don't know what time it is, but I can figure that out in a minute once I find right. my phone and, you know, get up and get moving. So it's it's interesting, you know, because we all do experience that. And I I remember from our previous conversation you talked a little, a lot about the traveling and how you guys managed that. So people might want to go back and listen to that part. So we don't have to rehash all of that, but it's just, I'm just amazed at, and this is credit to you is that you have managed to maintain as much of her old normalcy as possible. And I, that's not always, it's never easy and it's not always possible depending on how, like I tried really hard to, to simplify things that my mom enjoyed before she got more advanced in her disease and it just, it never worked. She was always stressed that she was doing it wrong. Like, it doesn't matter. You can't do it wrong. Just have fun. And that just didn't work for her. She was very just anxious. So it was very hard to be, to visit with her because she was always so anxious and she just wanted to sit around and shoot the breeze. Which would have been fine, but you know how it is when they ask the same question every two minutes, you're like, cannot do this anymore. <laughs> I it helped when we had when they, we had um, other, like I would take my mom and another one of the memory care residents out to the park, and people thought it was insane. I'm like, they talk to each other. I don't have to try to entertain my mom, and they understand each other, and they don't care if they've repeated the same right. conversation fifteen times. I can chime in when you know when I want, and and enjoy the you know the sunshine and the nature and. And the fact that they're enjoying themselves, but yeah, it was, it was almost easier if I had somebody else to be with mom that understood her 
or accepted her better, maybe is the right term? One of the things for us is the fact that we're always together. So it made it a little bit easier for us, for me especially, to notice the, the changes and what she needed and, and uh, her personality and what would have worked well for her and what didn't, as opposed to, you know, an individual that's going through this in the beginning, you know, you're in your 50s or early 60s and you're still trying to go to work and then come home and, and figure out what happened while you were gone uh, with your loved one that you left at home. Uh, so for us, we, since we were always together, it made it a lot easier for me to figure out uh, what the nuances were and what changes need to be made to make her the life more comfortable as we moved on. Yeah, I wish that's something my dad could have learned because I think his chronic health issues and his impatience made it very difficult for him to deal with my mom in a more positive manner. He wasn't that kind of person anyway. I was like, why can't you just do it this way? This makes sense. You know, he would remind her about things and then get really frustrated when she didn't remember, which was is stupid. But, you know, this was probably, let's see. She, well, it was between 2005 and 2017 when he passed away. So we we knew some less the back then than we know now. So, you know, and he he read he read some things. He did some research, but. You know, they didn't have as many books like yours out there. <clears throat> Excuse me. They didn't have All's Authors, which is one of my favorite. And you're an All's Author, if, if I recall correctly. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they just, they didn't have that stuff. And so it wasn't as easy to find the more positive ways of helping a caregiver. And so I got to come in and deal with my mom, who thought I was her best friend. So which, of course, that that kind of leans towards a little bit more formality than you might be with family. And she just didn't put up with people's nonsense because she always had to put up with my dad. So it did make my journey a little harder. So it's interesting to hear how being with them on a daily basis in some respects makes things easier because you can make changes easier and you understand their changes easier. So that's, um, that's kind of help beneficial. I hope it's beneficial to know. I think it's beneficial, even though my mom's gone. I can't put it into practice. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, what do you guys got planned besides Gainesville in the near future? Do you plan too far in advance at this point? Yes, actually, I do. Um, I usually know what we're going to do for the month. Uh, I plan to be gone from here uh, in terms of where we're staying about every two weeks. So I. Uh, if there's a race that's nearby, we try to do that. We also visit family. So uh, Catherine turned 62 in the 1st of May. So we're going to go back and see her family in the, the Indiana area. So we got a schedule for that and some races after that. And, you know, go we'll see one of my, I do have one child that lives here in the Atlanta area. So we can see them. And then I have one in Northern California. That's going to be a tough to see how we're going to get back out there. Uh, I have to stop in, you know, like Las Vegas or somewhere and, and take a, a couple of day break. But, uh, you know, we'll see how that works yeah, out. Atlanta to Vegas is a, a little bit more than, like Vegas from here is like an hour. Yeah. It's almost barely yeah. worth getting on yeah. the airplane. <laughs> right. yeah. It's about um, three hours and then you do an hour. So as opposed to doing the four hours, we'll see. Or, you know. Who knows? But and yeah, a, and, and then the other thing is uh, I have an abridged version of the book coming out uh, May 2nd. It's available for pre-sale right now on, you know, anywhere you want to go get your normal book fix in. You know, books a million, and, uh, Amazon, and, and uh, Barnes & Noble. Uh, I, I re redid the cover. This is what it looks like here. Uh, and we did an abridged version. So I had a, I, we did a number of cruises, so I took out a number of cruises that we talked about. Uh, and uh, I have a new, new publisher who is a little bit more aligned with my thought process in terms of uh, getting it out to folks that are, are affected with the, with the disease of Alzheimer's or you know, have somebody in their family, family member, or, you know, they're starting to figure out something might not be, be right and, and uh, can look at that. 
And uh, I still write to my blog. You can see uh, Running With Cat right here on my shirt. And it's uh, runningwithcat.com, C-A-T. And I write to it uh, probably every other week. Um, I just wrote a, a story about uh, migration. Unfortunately, Catherine started having uh, seizures. About 25% of individuals with Alzheimer's also have seizures. On a semi-regular basis, she was having them probably about every few weeks. And uh, to come to find out that uh, staying hydrated was, uh, plays an important role with the seizures of day. We did have her on seizure medication. However, um, <clears throat> some of the side effects are as bad as having a seizure. So we ended up taking her off of that. Uh, we're, just, we're just going at it. Yeah, she'll have another one in sometime, but we're trying to space them out as, as long as possible. She's gone three months since she had the last one since we switched up to you know, trying to stay hydrated. So we'll see how it works out. That's awesome. Are you familiar with jelly drops? Jelly drops? Yeah, they're basically, and I don't even know exactly how they do this. And I'm going to link their, their episode in the show notes as well for the new people who haven't heard that one. And you can go back and listen to it if you want. So this young man was caring for his grandmother who had dementia. She kind of had the similar problem that happens with a lot of people with dementia, got very dehydrated. We know that that's bad. And as his university studies, um, part of what he was trying to do, he was trying to figure out a way of providing um, like a solid water, sort of solid oh, water. So it's, it's like Jello. Right. Um, kind of right. tastes like Jello, but it's like ninety eight percent water. So, uh -huh. um, and they're not they're maybe the size of an egg. There's two different sizes, um, a snack size and then a bigger one. And it's you know they taste good. They're they're sweet. They're not overly sweet. They're uh, probably less sweet than Jello. I haven't had Jello in I don't know how long. <laughs> and you know, like I said, they're like ninety eight percent water. And so the when I did the recording with the, uh, the founder, they sent me a package and it was kind of nice. Cause sometimes you get really tired of just swigging the right, water and, right. um, you know, all yeah. I drink is tea and water. So yeah. Um, right. if you just right. Google jelly drops, the U S yep. um, U S website will come up and, um, she would probably love those and you oh, can yeah. take them with you on your run yep. and yep. just yep. chomp on one. You know, right. they're not, they're, 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 they were a very ingenious um, invention, and I have known about them for a long time, but they were not available in the United States until last year. So okay. I had to wait until they they were able to ramp up big enough to to ship them to the United States, or they probably have a manufacturer here. I don't, I don't know how all that stuff works, um, but they're really good, so you might yeah, want to give those I'll, a try. Yeah, we'll try that, and I'll, I'll write about it and let everybody know what, what I found out. That's good. And then I know a caregiver that likes to give her mom straight watermelon juice. Yeah. We were actually talking about my husband bought oranges at the grocery store and they're huge. They're like almost small grapefruits. They're really huge. Oh, wow. And I was like, those are really big. I hope they're sweet and juicy. You know, we're at the end of the season. Those are right, really big. Right, right. They're not bad. They're not super sweet. But I was like, this is probably the last batch of oranges we should get because then, you know, after that, they're not going to be that great. And he's like, yeah, hopefully we're getting close to watermelon season because we eat watermelon <laughs> like every morning with breakfast right. just about yeah. in the summer. And watermelon is just very hydrating. So yes. Yes. I was like, we should get some fresh mint, one of those little personal watermelons, just grind it up, make watermelon juice and milk. so good. <laughs> mm -hmm. So great. what else is anything else exciting coming up? I'll make sure that the book is linked in the show notes. Got a lot of stuff you guys need to check out in the show notes this week. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I sent you a film. A short mm -hmm. film was done. Um, that was, uh, it took me a while to actually sit down and be able to, it's only 15 minutes long, but for me to actually sit there and, and watch it because it was very emotional for me to see, you know, to see the changes that uh, have taken place since it was done a year ago. But uh, wow. it, it, gives, it gives people a, a good understanding of how we went about it, basically trying to find joy and, and enjoying our time together and doing the things that we love to do. So I would, uh, if you could put that in there, let me link it into a YouTube video on that. That would be great. Yep. Um, that's, I remembered that as soon as you said, I was like, oh yeah, <clears throat> I have yeah. that link handy for when I write the show notes. So 
It's a good thing we're not talking too, too long like I have a tendency to do because people got episodes to listen to and mo- little short movies to watch. Right, <laughs> we're giving right. them a lot of stuff today. Yeah, there you go. And then also I'm going to, uh, you can put in there anybody that uh, writes you and then you can send me their information. I'll send them an autographed copy of, the, of our book. To, to well, that's one very person kind that of you. you. That you pick the, the first one that contacts you on it. And I'll send it out here free of charge. Absolutely. Well, my email one. is always in the show notes. So you guys heard it here. The first email that I get requesting a signed copy of the the latest edition of Running Around the World. We'll get one straight from Tony. Yeah, I have uh, a gentleman. I did a 10 book giveaway about uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. And I had a gentleman that, that I actually had done a race with. We had done a tour together. I hadn't heard from him in quite a while. And he said, hey, you know, it's still available. I said, oh, yeah, you're number eight. And then he sent me his address in New Zealand. Oh, my. <laughs> so, you know, I sent him sent him a book. And, you know, he took a picture of him holding his book in, in uh, New Zealand. So that's pretty cool. But, you know, it's, it's people in New Zealand are reading what I have to say. And I think that's, that's pretty neat. That is cool. And I'm assuming yeah. you guys did a run in New Zealand? Ah, uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Queenstown. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Yes, we're working on traveling to at least as many of the 48 states as possible. When I was 12, we kind of gave up a lot of traveling. I'm not really sure why. Just mm. family life, you know. My <laughs> my sister and I are opposite personalities, so traveling with us was probably not that pleasant. So <laughs> A lot of reasons, but yeah, I haven't I haven't seen enough states yet. So we were originally planning to go to Australia in May with the Rotary International Convention. Plane tickets were ten grand. I said, forget it. We have a kitchen from 1988 that I would like to roll a bomb through. Um, it's huge, but not very functional. I'm like, if we're gonna spend ten grand just to get to Australia, yeah, I'll just never mind. So we're going on a three week road trip to Glacier National Park in August. I actually use chat GPT to, to lay out a route from Sacramento, California to Glacier National Park, 300 miles in between each stop or thereabouts, staying at the KOA campgrounds because we really like those. And it did it in like 15 seconds. So my heart oh. was impressed. <laughs> I had to try yeah. it out because I've read an article about, well, can AI be your travel agent? And the answer is sort of. Right. So, you know, I sent him the little itinerary and I said, this is probably a good starting point. I noticed like one uh, segment was like 146 miles. That's a little short, but then maybe it gives us more time to explore the area. Um, I don't know if you've ever pulled a trailer, but after about 300 miles, the person who's doing all the driving, which is my husband, um, it's just, it's, it's exhausting. Like you yeah. can drive a car three, four, 500 miles. Not that bad. You're pulling a trailer. You know, the the neck and the shoulder muscles are all <laughs> very tight. And so that's our plans. We went to the uh, Rose Bowl Parade for 2023. That was a nice way to start out the year. And other than, oh, and I went to Washington, D.C. back in March with the Alzheimer's Association. That was my first oh, right. time to D.C. So I I managed to walk about 11 miles one day, which was way more than I've ever done. <laughs> But I made the most of that trip. I, the only thing I missed was going to the Ford Theater. I realized when I got home, I was like, oh, shoot. I was headed that way, and then I went some other direction, and I missed that one. So I guess I'll have to go back. <laughs> yeah, we're going to try to get uh, a second time around to get all 50 states. This time is half marathon. We've got uh, 42 of them done already. So Oof. Well, we got, we're we taking a little, little break, uh, ready for the spring season to start up uh, right about now. And uh, put some on the schedule and kind of tick them off. Uh, what we'll do is um, I kind of I'll walk some and then we'll put her in the captain bill and I'll run some and we'll go back and forth and hit, uh, hit, this, hit the states done. Uh, and That's charge it awesome. Out. Yep. Yep. Well, and I then appreciate we'll go back it. Around uh-huh. and get 10K, then we'll go back around and get 10Ks done and then 5Ks and we'll just keep going at it. So, just keep circling the yeah, uh, yeah. 50 states until right. you can't do it anymore. That's See, no. that's an awesome goal. 
Yep. We've actually talked about, you know, maybe in, so my husband's 58, I'm 56, you know, maybe in about 10 years. This is kind of scary because I'm a, I'm a homebody. I like to travel. I like to go places, see new things, but I also like to come home to my little cozy nest. We've talked about selling the house and traveling around the country in our trailer um, with our either, right now we only have one golden retriever, which is highly unusual for us. We fortunately lost a, the youngest one to cancer back in February. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, golden retrievers are way overbred, so that's a very big problem. We've had six. One is still alive. Three have passed from cancer. So, you know, it doesn't take too many brains to figure out that those are not great odds. Um, but she loves to travel. She don't care where she's going. Why don't we go someplace? <laughs> she's ready to go. Um, yeah. So we're, we've thought about doing that. She won't be around in 10 years because she's almost nine now. But That's a good goal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my maternal grandparents in 1985, so just for reference, I graduated from high school in 84. They sold their home in my old hometown. And that's what they did. They traveled the country into Canada and into Mexico with their, at the time, their 35 foot fifth wheel, which was a huge thing back in the oh, 80s. Oh, Nowadays, I, I don't know. They got, they got fifth wheels that like are yeah. just gigantic. It's yeah. crazy. <laughs> so we've, we've talked about that. We'll see how that goes. That's, that's a few years off. I mean, we've only lived here for 18 months, so <laughs> got to get a little more use out of it. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. So well, this has been goal. great. Yeah, I nice catching up with you. Yeah, yeah you too. Um, thanks for reaching out and and let me know what was going on. And I haven't watched the movie yet, but I will. Every well, time I, have I think some, about I, it, I'm... have some tissues in. Okay. <laughs> <Thanks> <laughs> I'll tell you that right now. I'll tell you that right now. Yeah, awesome. Well, the, Anthony's book is very much, it's a very touching story. It's kind of a little part um, travel blog and got some caregiving suggestions like how he's doing it so you know if you want a lightweight book to read that's a really good one to pick up so like we said it's in the show notes so absolutely. thanks so much anthony enjoy Thank your you. trip okay. and we'll catch up again soon absolutely thanks a lot you're welcome fading memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts